is in progress. Okay. Uh, anyway, it was uh, to uh, my, my job was to uh, identify countries that had resources that corporations covet, and then arrange huge loans to those corporations from the World Bank and other sister organizations of the World Bank and also Wall Street. These monies were used to hire our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in those countries, power plants and electrical systems, highways, industrial parks, ports, things that helped the very rich families in these countries, the families that own the industries, that own the banks and the commercial establishments, as well as making huge profits for U.S. companies that built the, pro that built the projects. But the majority of the people in the recipient country, the one with the resources, suffered because money was diverted from uh, health and education and other social services to, to pay off the interest on the loans. And in the long run, the country wasn't usually able to pay off uh, the principal on the loan. And so we went to the collateral. And the collateral role that we had established was the resources still in the ground. So our oil companies or, or whatever, in some cases it might be different minerals or it might be big markets or whatever, uh, our companies would go in. It, it, Recording many, in progress. Not quite sure what's going on here. We I'm sorry, John. I hit the stop recording button by accident. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we would, uh, so in, in, in any case, it, it, when the country couldn't repay its loans, uh, we, and that was usually under the guise of the International Monetary System, which is kind of the policing organization in this whole system, we'd go in and, and say, hey, since you can't pay your loans, uh, sell our resource, sell your resources, your undeveloped resources, cheap to our corporations without environmental or social regulations. Um, and you might wonder why the president of a country would accept these onerous deals. And there were really several reasons. One is that they, they had the resources and they needed the money, but they didn't have the ability to develop the resources. They didn't have the technology. And often they didn't even have the willpower, uh, the political will to develop those technologies. And second, um, the, the president and his or her cronies would become very rich off this system. They were they and their friends were the ones who owned the industries, and they and uh, they would become rich off this. And the third reason, they knew that standing behind me and these economic policies were what we called the jackals, and these are people usually CIA assets who overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. And unfortunately, the United States has a long history that we've admitted to of doing exactly that with Mossadegh, democratically elected prime minister of Iran, with Lumumba in the Congo, with Diem and Zim in the in Vietnam, Allende in Chile, Arbenz in Guatemala. Most recently, in 2009, Zelaya in Honduras. We have this history, and we've admitted to most of those. And so the leader of a country is presented with this situation where he can accept these large loans and he and his family will make a lot of money off it. And we produce reports that show that when you inject this money into a country, it increases the economy, it increases the GDP. And in fact, it does. And statistically, we can prove that. And so for many years, I thought I was doing the right thing by, by implementing this system, which we now call the economic hitman or the EHM strategy. Um, but what I soon, but, but after several years, what I began to understand was that GDP and the metrics we use are totally skewed in favor of the rich. So if you take a country like the United States, where three individuals, three individuals have as much wealth as half the population. And if last year those three individuals increased their income by, or increased their value of their assets by 10%, and half the country lost 3%, and the rest of the country would remain constant, you would show an increase overall of almost 4%. And it would look as though the whole country prospered. But in fact, only those three individuals prospered.
everybody else either remained the same or became worse off. And if that's true in a country where three individuals own as much as half the population, what do you think could be true in a country where three individuals own as much as 90% of the population? So I began to understand this, and that's why I got out and have devoted the rest of my life to, to totally exposing this system. But it's been a very, very effective system, and it, and it became especially effective after 1991 with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Because during my time in the 70s, we were competing with, with the Soviet Union. And that was a motivating factor. We didn't want the red tide, the communist tide, to take over the United States and much of the rest of the world. But after 1991, there was no Soviet Union, and we had pretty much free reign. But the economic hitmen pretty much blew it. Um, because instead of showing the world how good a system we could create through democracy and some uh, good form of capitalism, instead we continued to exploit countries and we built military bases on their soil. And one of the conditions when the IMF goes in and renegotiates loans is not just that the country will sell its resources, its oil or whatever, cheaply to our, our, our corporations, but also that it will uh, support us and votes of the United Nations or allow us to build military bases on its soil, which we did a lot of. There's well over 100 countries where, that have military bases and another 50 or so that have a, military, a U.S. military presence. People don't like that. We didn't like it when the British were here in, in, in America. So, but from 1991 until around 2013, we had pretty much free reign. And around 2013, it began before that, but 2013 is when President Xi became the head of China. And it, that was really the time when China had learned incredible lessons from our economic hitmen, from me and others. In fact, I, I taught in a business school in in, in Shanghai, and I began to understand that those students were really trying to learn from our mistakes and our successes. And in the last decade, China has done so much better than us than we ever did. Uh, it's really entered this matrix, and it dominates this matrix today. It, it is the largest investor, uh, and, and the, the, it has the largest um, uh, economic relationships with, of any country on the planet today. It, it, it dominates every continent, in, including our own. You know, with the United States is very dependent. We're actually the two countries that are quite interdependent on each other for economic growth. But China has really taken over Africa and Latin America and much of Asia and the Middle East. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's the biggest investment in the, the investor in those regions, and it's the biggest trader in those regions. And on top of that, it controls some resources that are very vital to developing a green economy, lithium and uh, cobalt and coltan. It controls most of the mines where those minerals are produced primarily in, uh, in Africa, and to some extent, Latin America. China controls them. It, own, it owns the, the leases on those mines. So it's really entered this matrix big time. And it has a, a marvelous tool, and that is the New Silk Road. And so China, unlike the United States, has uh, really advocated that if you they go to a country, well, we would go to a country, I would go to a country, and our economic hitman would say, hey, take these loans from us, hire our corporations to build big infrastructure on your projects, and watch your whole economy increase, and have bilateral trade with the United States and be our friends. China goes in and says, hey, take these big loans from us, from our banks, which are now bigger than the World Bank, and uh, hire our companies to build these big infrastructure projects, and you'll become part of the new Silk Road. You will be trading with countries around the world. This is not a bilateral relationship with China. We are developing. 
a system of trade throughout the world that you will be part of. It's called the Belt and Road Initiative or the New Silk Road. And the Belt are the land transportation and communication systems that fan out from China to throughout Asia and the Middle East and Europe and, and Africa. And the road are the ports, are the, are the transportation systems primarily by ship where China's building ports <clears throat> all over Latin America and uh, Africa and, and in, the, in, the, in the island nations. And it's really a, a, a psychological tool that has great appeal in other countries to be part of this network. And the other aspect that China has is that, that, that it's flagged is, is that it doesn't build military bases in other countries, although it's beginning to. Uh, and it's got a big military base in Djibouti now, and it's looking at other places where it may do this. And I'm not trying to say that China is a, <laughs> a good country that, that we shouldn't be uh, c concerned about. Uh, certainly, well, what China is doing some very, very bad things. There's absolutely no question about it. We have all know about the Uyghur uh, minority problem. We, we know about Taiwan and Tibet and, and Hong Kong and along the Indian border. All, that whole, uh, the, the, there's, some, there's some terrible stuff going on that China is doing. I'm not trying to paint China into a great picture. But what I am trying to indicate is that China has taken extensive control over the global economy. And today, the United States, if you measure in terms of GDP, gross domestic product, the United States has about 25% of the world total. China has, has about uh, 17%. And the next country is Japan with, with about 5%. So China and the United States control almost 45% of the world's economy. I, I, I shouldn't say control. They have about 45%. They control a lot more because they control so many resources in other parts of the world. At the same time, they're contributing about 40% of the CO2 emissions on the planet. The United States, again, is about 20, about 25% of CO2 emissions, and, and, and China's about 15%, with Russia a, a far behind third. Uh, so these two countries have the biggest economies and also are the biggest polluters. And if we want to end climate change, if we want to move forward and create what I call a life economy, turn a death economy, an economic system that's basically destroying itself, it's using up all its long-term resources for short-term profits, if we want to transform the situation into a life economy that, that basically rewards people, that pays people that, for developing long-term benefits, for cleaning up pollution, for regenerating destroyed environments, for recycling and for developing technologies that don't ravage the earth. If, if, if we want these things to happen, we're going to have to work with China in this regard. These two countries that control so much of the world's economy and so much of the world's resources and create so much of the pollution, we simply must work together. That does not mean we have to accept each other's political systems or human rights abuses. We can disagree on just about everything, but we need to agree on ending this terribly destructive, polluting world economy that we have, this death economy. And so we, this matrix today, <laughs> there's two big powers in the matrix that's controlling the world, and that's the United States and, 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 and China. And I, you know, it concerns me that there's such aggression between the two. I haven't even talked about Russia and Ukraine, and I won't get into that at this point, but that has thrown another monkey wrench into this picture, and it's, it's created a lot of problems for China, a lot of challenges for China, incidentally. But I think at this time, I should invite John Cobb to join me, to, to join me in a conversation around this, because what I was so struck by is how John wrote letters to President Xi and President Biden pleading with them to come together to end climate change, to do exactly what we're suggesting here. And it was, and, and, he, and he had a way of getting these letters to each of those individuals. He knew people in, in, in positions that could get the letters and they were, and the letters were hand delivered to those people. And it was only a, a, a month or a couple months later uh, that they had a virtual phone call, President Xi and President Biden. 
And I think John would say, and I guess we'd all say, we don't know whether those letters had an impact or not, but what we do know, we don't know whether they read them or not, but what we do know is that the results were exactly what we were looking for, that they started to talk. Things have since deteriorated because of the, of the Russia-Ukraine situation. But I think that, 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 that this Living Earth movement that John is really the, 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 the inspiration behind and a number of us are organizers on it, 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 one of its main missions is to bring China and the United States together to accomplish this one goal. And again, we don't have to agree on other things, but we need to agree on this. John, what do you have to say? Well, I have to say, I hope that you didn't go too fast and that everybody understood what, what you told them, because I don't know anyone who has been on the inside of the situation to the extent that you have and is willing and able to explain it to, to the rest of us. Uh, I've... Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure the, how, how to put this, but I think that I have focused more attention in my understanding of what was going on, on U.S. foreign policy and the takeover of our foreign policy by the neoconservatives. And I would, I'm would. i curious whether do you think that that's an accurate statement or that I need to be to mod modify my, my, my opinion is that the, the neoconservatives built upon a lot of what was already going on, but became much more clearer and more explicit that the goal is for the U.S to do, dominate the whole planet. And that Russia and China have been the main obstacles to the achievement of that. And therefore, China is called enemy number one. And I think Russia once was enemy number one, but it's sort of become enemy num number two. Does that make sense to you? Or would you criticize that way of viewing things? Yeah, I know that makes total sense to me. Um, I, I agree with you. I, um, you know, it's one of my jobs when I was an economic hitman was to uh, impose neo, neo, what we call neoliberal economic policies on countries uh, if, when they couldn't pay their debts. And this meant uh, making the, the uh, dropping taxes on the rich and if, and uh, instituting austerity programs for everybody else. That was part of it. Privatizing companies and, and uh, privatizing public sector uh, businesses uh, like utility companies and selling them to our investors. It was part of neoliberalism. But, um, and it was backed up by what we call the Washington Consensus, which is uh, the World Bank, uh, the IMF, and their sister organizations. Uh, and it, uh, it turns out that it was a policy that, that worked in the short run. It, it worked, and the short run was fairly long, you know, it, was, it certainly took it, it was huge, huge, had a huge impact after 1991 until recently. What we didn't know was that a lot of the world deeply resented this. They bought into it, and so much of the world loves America, loves Americans, they want to live here, but our policies, our government policies and our corporate policies are detested in many, many parts of the world. And uh, China has, has stepped in and said, That's, we're not doing that. And we're not going to impose our political will on any country that takes our debt. Uh, we don't go in and tell you how to spend the debt like the United States does and did, like I did, to, to either put it in electric power systems or, or train systems or highways, China says, we'll, we'll give you uh, the, these loans and you decide what to do with them. Well, and it's very attractive. It, it also has some drawbacks in that it, it really opens the door wide for corruption in countries. If you let 
certain leaders choose what to do with the loans without any essentially any oversight, they can use these for deeply self-serving purposes. So there's a balance there. But, but, but you're entirely right that now China is taking advantage. And I have to say, I speak Spanish, I spent a lot of time in Latin America. In writing this book, I've been in touch with people all over the world extensively talking with them. I recently spoke in, in a, in, at a big conference in Russia where Putin was also a speaker. That was in 2017. It wasn't all that recent, but it was, so it was before the Ukraine situation and in places like Kazakhstan and China and, and, and all over Latin America. And you know, John, it's, it, it, it's discouraging to hear people say, you know, to hear leaders of countries like Ecuador and Peru and Guatemala and Colombia and other countries say, you know, we'd rather take loans from China than the United States now. We, we need the loans to develop our resources, but we'd rather take them from China because China doesn't try to impose its will on our politics. And also China's never built a military base on our soil. The United States has. And, and the United States has bullied us around a lot recently. And, and China hasn't done that. And, and I like to say to them, well, don't you think China will? <laughs> and uh, the answer is, well, it's possible, but they haven't. And you have. Uh, you know, you're the, you're, you're the enemy we can see. China may be the hidden enemy, but at the point now, they're, they're hidden. So, yeah, I totally, totally agree with you that we implemented these policies that were draconian and self-serving and imperialistic and they're backfiring on us now. My phone was ringing, so I muted it for, <laughs> for a little while. Uh, uh, another question that I, I would like to ask you, I think that the greatest strength of capitalism is that uh, competition among people is supposed to, and I think to some extent, a uh, whole hold prices down and lead to the uh, production of superior material, to, to material products to be sold on the market. But I have the impression now that there is a great deal more cooperation among the major corporations. And uh, I was just reading this morning that most of the increase in price is not due to increase in costs, but simply is a way of getting more profit out of sales. And that sounds to me as though it's not, ca not capitalism anymore. It's, oh, it's monopoly capitalism, I guess you could say. If the corporations work together, not so as to avoid competition. Yes. It's something I call predatory capitalism, John. And it, you know, capitalism, uh, the, the, the shortest def def definition really is, is it's a system where the means of production and commerce are not owned by the government and where competition is encouraged. And um, it's certainly in the United States, uh, the means of production are not owned by the government, but, but the people who own the means of production pretty much own the government. Yes. And nobody gets elected to a high position in, in, in our government and in politics in the United States without the support of, of money, which comes usually from corporations, either directly or indirectly. And yes, you, we, we certainly have this situation where we've, we've driven out a lot of competition. You know, anyone who's tried to open or try to continue to have a hardware store in a place where one of the big, one of the big hardware stores uh, come in and knows that. The same could be true of, of, of pharmacists and you know, uh, so many things that were they just driven out. Um, and you know, it's interesting because we have laws against um, collusion amongst companies, but they don't really have to collude because uh, they all operate under the same principle. And that is something that was defined by Nobel Prize winning uh, economist Milton Friedman, won the Nobel Prize in 1976 and became very popular around the world with his, his I mean, he, Friedman said a lot of things and some of them made a lot of sense, but one of the most important and one of the most detrimental things he said was the only responsibility of business is to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. In fact, he said 
that if you maximize short-term profits, you will take care of environmental and social problems. And, uh, did he explain and, that at all? And, well, he, he had some fancy models that would show this, but it's, it's easy to produce fancy models that will show almost anything you want them to show. <laughs> and of course, you know, the whole idea of trickle-down economics, which is part of the yeah. neoliberalism and, and part of that theory, it doesn't work. We've seen that very clearly. And that's another argument that, that China uses and uh, in promoting its system is that it's 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 bottom up. Uh, that's uh, and I'm not saying it really is. I, I you know it, 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 uh, in many respects it isn't, but that's the argument. That's that's what it sells and the idea that neoliberalism uh, doesn't work. And so much of the world, uh, the world that controls so many of our resources, especially in Africa and Latin America have been have been badly hurt by neoliberalism or neoconservatism oh. <laughs> and and uh, they resent this and so the china's arguments ring true for them and are, and are, and are attractive for them uh, i heard uh, and heard something that i think is fact factual but i can't i don't have personal experience of it there's a Japanese company that um, specialized on the slaughter of a particular kind of whale, and it was killing them faster than they could reproduce. And someone said, wouldn't it be better to ease up on killing them so that this could be a sustainable operation? And the answer was, no, we can make more money if we kill them all and then just take the money and invest it in something else. And I think that is completely consistent with the way in which economic theory is often taught. If you make more money just by, by using something up, there's no reason not to do that. Yeah, I, I just see a, a, a chat that says I need to move closer to the microphone. Is this better? Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Um, well, that's again, that goes back to the short term profit yes. idea that, that, and we know that most executives of, of major corporations uh, only expect to have their jobs for a few years. Uh, there are exceptions, but that's, that's pretty typical. And in any case, uh, their main concern is the short term. It, we used to think it was the annual report, and then it was. And then people said it was the quarterly report, and but really, it's the, it's the daily report at the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I've met with I, a lot of corporate executives, high up ones, uh, and uh, who tell me um, things like. Um, you know, I, I have grandchildren. I want to make my company greener, but I know that if I if 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 my stock prices go down over a fairly short period of time, or if I lose market share, uh, my main shareholders will replace me, and they'll replace me with someone who only cares about market share or stock prices, and so they'll say, you know, I, I need to hang in there and do the best that I can and not get fired. And they'll also tell me, you know, sp speak to all the people who listen to you and, and, and ask them to write emails to me uh, and, uh, and, and circulate these to all their, their social networking circles and say things like, hey, I love your product, but I'm not going to buy it anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia or China <laughs> a fair salary or you, 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 you cut back on your pollution or, or whatever it is. So, and I would encourage everybody that's listening here, pick a corporation that you're, that you're upset with. It, it, could, it could range from an oil company to a sports good manufacturer like Nike and, and send them emails and, and send, all those, and send the, those emails and ask all of your social networking circles to send them out too and ask them to send them to their social networking circles because then these corporate executives can take those letters to their um, primary investors and their executive committees, their, their owners in, in essence, and say, hey, listen, we've got to listen to our customers. You guys 
Now, I may not as CEO need to worry about the long run because I only get this job for the next couple of years probably. But you're investors and you've got children too and, and, and we need to look out for the long term and your, your, your clients, your consumers are demanding that we do a better job. So you, you, you think there really is a possibility of organizing consumers to improve the capitalist system? I keep getting muted. Oh, uh, I'm on. I, yes, I, uh, I, I think consumers, uh, every, we're all consumers. So that's a, that's a huge yeah, movement yeah. and it's early to do, it's easy to do these days with social networking. And, but also if, you know, if all the workers in these corporations and all the investors and the consumers and management, you know, we, what we need to do is to create a new value of success so that rather than having success be defined as, as short-term profits, uh, to define success as long-term benefits for people and nature. And once we do that, when we replace the people um, who run our big companies, I think of Jack Welch, although he's not at GE anymore, but he's still admired as this guy who took the company to great profitability by firing tens of thousands of people. When we get him off the cover and then people like him today off the covers of Time and, and Newsweek and, and Fortune and put John Cobb on the cover instead, then we start to move into a new value system that we can, that we can all buy into and, and, can, and can teach to our children, which is really important because today in business school, as during my time, we, we're, we were taught that you've got to maximize short-term profits. In fact, it's much more so now than it was in my time when I was in exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I, I will. I, I have been extremely critical of our educational system, and specifically of the academic disciplines, which pride themselves so on being value-free, precisely because it leads to this kind of thing. And I'm very glad to say that. Recently, a very high level academic institution called the American Academy of Arts and Sciences made the public statement that up until now, they have believed that the task of the university was simply to provide the facts and then offer the facts to whoever wanted to have them. And the, the person who consumes the facts will be the one who decides what to do with them. So the values are in the hands of somebody else. But uh, this prestigious organization said, but the situation with respect to global warming or climate change is so serious that we now think it's appropriate for the university to actually take some responsibility for doing something about it. Not to me, that is the very elementary common sense. But under the circumstances, it may be the beginning of the crumbling of a very awful academic system that has taught people to think that making money is, well, it's the reason for going to college these days is so that you can get a better job, a job that pays more. This is, this is not education and for our whole educational system to buy into this as normative and desirable. And I, I'm hearing a bad echo, I don't know what to do about that. So I, I agree with you that we should have democracy, but I think it would also help if we had a school system that inculcated values other than money making yeah. in, into the citizens because if the if the if you have a democracy and the democracy is ruled by value free citizens and of course that doesn't mean they're value free it just means that money is the supreme value i'm afraid that having lots of people involved in the same goal is that's still not going to get this very far. 
Yes, and you know, I it's interesting to me that that I people, my friends in Latin America and elsewhere will say to me, you know, if America is a democracy, we don't want it. Yes. You're dysfunctional. Uh, you can't get anything done there. Uh, and they'll say the Chinese can get a lot of things done. You can't seem to get anything done. The Republicans and Democrats won't agree on anything. It's dysfunctional. We don't, we don't want that. Uh, I think that's very unfortunate. I believe t completely in democracy, but I don't really think we are one. No. <laughs> you know? and no, I, 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 I thought you were anyway. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think that we were headed in that direction uh, for a long time. We never, we never were truly a democracy, but we were headed in that direction. But recently we've taken a bad setback. And we know that the big corporations have so much control and now we're seeing social network has so networking has so much control and this you know it's being bought out by individuals um so i think this is a this is a very important consideration here to ask ourselves who are we and how do we lead the world because we are still in a position where the world does look to us we are the largest economy as well as the largest polluter and we're certainly the largest military force uh, and how do we move forward in a way that can lead the world? And I really think our corporations have to play a role in this. So we all need to get involved, as I said earlier, that um, because the corporations in some respect are the, are the biggest institutions in the world, the most powerful in, in, in some respects. And so as consumers, as investors, as workers, as some of us management and so forth, we, we really need to get involved and let these corporations know that we want to change a value. And, and I, I've changed of values. And I will say, John, I, I've seen as I've traveled around the world in the last years and, and, and done it by virtually in the last couple of years, uh, that there's a, there's a consciousness revolution. People are waking up to the fact that this system isn't working, that we're destroying ourselves. And I, I, I see that more incredibly strong in China. You know, the young Chinese have gone through awful pollution. They, 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 everything we hear about the terrible pollution is true and they've experienced it and they don't want their kids to have to experience it. So there is this awakening everywhere. Uh -huh. You know, a few years ago, I, if I spoke in colleges, let's say a decade or two ago, uh, I had to convince people there was climate change. Not anymore. The young people pretty much accept this. And, uh, and they're looking for solutions uh, and we need to be you know the ones to guide them along the lines of solutions and that means a change of value a change of perception of what it means to be a successful human being on this planet it doesn't mean accumulating more material wealth it doesn't mean running a corporation in a way that maximizes short-term profits it means maximizing long-term benefits for people and nature and that, that's why the work that you've done, John, throughout your life, and now that the Living Earth Movement is doing, you know, we're all here on this now because of the Living Earth Movement, it's why it's so important because there is a consciousness change. At the same time, there's a pushback. And so whenever there's a revolution or whenever agents of change emerge with power, the status quo pushes back. We've seen this throughout history. And if the, the, the agents of change, if the revolutionaries, and maybe that's too strong a word to, to use, but it's consciousness revolution here. If we accept the pushback is giving us energy, like a good martial artist, you know, mm -hmm. I was a martial artist, I've been most of my life. And we know that if you, you, you can't, if you come up against a guy who's stronger and bigger than you, you don't want to try to overpower him because you're not going to do it. You got to use the energy turn it around and use it to your advantage and against his advantage. And the same is true with, with these revolutions, that the, when we see the pushback like we're seeing today from a lot of the status quo, uh, we, we take energy from that. And we know that it's happening because they understand that we're winning and uh, they fear that. And so we, we can take energy from it. There is a consciousness revolution. You know, it's big. It's really, really big. It's, not, it's just not that strong yet, but it's big yeah. and it's getting stronger every day. And listen, I, I, I'll shut up in just a minute and then I can turn this over to other people too. But, you know, we've seen the rise of, of conscious capitalism, of, green, of the Green New Deal, 
of B corporations and benefit corporations. And, and in, in August 2019, prior to the pandemic, 192 of the world's top corporate executives came together for the business roundtable. And they make it, issued a statement that our goals can no longer be about maximizing short-term profits. We have to take into account our, our, our customers and our, our workers and the communities where we work. They made that statement. But now we have to hold them to that statement. Mm -hmm. And we have to do that through our pocketbooks by not buying from them if they don't do that. And they, I think they, they want, the ones that I, well, many of the ones I know, want us to pressure them to do the right thing. I think it's a very important thing to understand. And the sociopaths among them who may not agree, sociopaths are driven by success, the idea of being successful. As long as we define success as maximization of short-term profits, that's where they'll go for. But if we turn that around and define it as long-term benefits for people in nature, then the sociopaths will be the biggest advocates. Um. Bonnie, do we have some more time or is it time to open up for everybody? Well, we have um, more time if you want it. Please, John, why don't you uh, both share some, uh, just a little bit more conversation. We'll open it up for others. Well, okay. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, the United States is not only thinking of China as enemy number one, but it's acting on that. And I'm wondering whether you have any idea how the U.S. thinks it can weaken China to the extent that it wants to. What well, weapons do we have? Unfortunately, I, I don't think the thinking is there. It's the politics. And as you pointed out, uh, as you pointed out in your letter to President Xi, he has to recognize that for President Biden to take a pro-China stance would probably be political suicide. <laughs> and it's true of all politicians in our country, unfortunately. Uh, like empires throughout history, we always want to have enemies. And when the Soviet Union stopped being an enemy, we, we had free reign for a while, but then we developed enemies. It was the Muslims, it was, it was Iraq, and then it was Afghanistan, and, and, and now it's China. It's a rallying force. And I think the only solution to that is for all of us to come together and say, listen, we, we can't live that way. We don't need to buy into their system. We don't need to accept what they're doing to the Uyghurs. Just as they, they, will, they will, if I want to bring that up with my Chinese friends, you know, they'll turn around and say, well, what about your own prison system? What about what you did in Iraq and, and Afghanistan to people? So. There's culpability on both sides. Uh, we can continue to have those discussions around those kinds of issues, but we must agree that, that the one driving issue that we have to come together to create an economic system that no longer destroys the long term, that no longer destroys the future for our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. Thank you. Bonnie, I think we should open it up now. All right. Well, uh, thank you, John and John. And um, we are so indebted to both of you. And I am very much um, looking forward to hearing people's comments and getting to know everybody on this call. And uh, so who would like to begin? David Corton, would you like to um, uh, come and participate in this conversation? Any comments that you'd like to make? David, do you agree that corporations rule the world these days? <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly do agree that the corporations rule the world. Uh, I'm more skeptical about the idea that corporations as they currently exist can change that. I mean, one of the things that's necessary to, to recognize is that these corporate CEOs don't actually have as much power as we sometimes attribute to them hmm. because you also have th these uh, financial firms that hmm. if you know it, this thing that you mentioned about the uh, 
the corporate executives being concerned about their the security of their jobs goes all the way up to the uh, CEO. If you're if you're a financier that wants to be maximizing profits, uh, the CEO is your first target. Um, so, I mean, I think part of the we have to have a lot more of the conversation, and this is what I'm hoping to get into with with Jeff in our uh, session next month. Um, we have to go very deep in terms of the thinking about the changes. And it will include, have to include deep changes in the, the way we structure ownership. Uh, you know, part of the corporate problem is it, it is the problem of that extraordinary concentration of power in the concentration of financial wealth. Uh, I, I, I think, I mean, our, our biggest problem to me in terms of um, China and the United States is as long as we're, we frame the problem in terms of uh, competing for money, then, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the conflict between China and the U.S. Is, is inevitable. There's no common ground. Well, the common ground would be let's rule the world together um, and we'll control the whole economy. Um, but I think, you know, I think we have to take this much deeper. I mean, the, the incredible thing in pursuing money is recognizing, you know, we can't eat money. <laughs> you know, the, the, the kind of foundational points that we have to be making are so foundational. We can't eat money. And there are no winners on a dead earth. Oh, that kind of redefines the problem right there. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and there is where you have the, the common interest between the United States and China and all the rest of the world's people is that we are all living beings and we all depend on the health of the living earth. And we, we could have just money flowing out all over the place and it's absolutely worthless. There is no actual value in money itself. So these are just the, the kind of very foundational things. And it's why, you know, why I get so enthusiastic about this framing around an ecological civilization, where you start not from money, but you start from our nature as living beings and what life depends on in terms of the health of living systems, starting with the living earth. And we have to totally rethink our understanding of money. Money can be a very useful tool, but when we, as soon as we start thinking about money as purpose, we're really in, in, in very deep trouble. I, I was very pleased this morning to, to learn that the United Nations has finally come out with a statement about the fact that what, something like 70% of the planet has been degraded uh, the way we produce food now makes money for the corporations, but it degrades the earth. It poisons the earth. And the earth, if it were not poisoned, would be absorbing a lot of the carbon that is now creating other problems. And if, if we had, had topsoil, healthy topsoil again over the planet, we would have much better prospects of growing food in chaotic weather systems than we do. I just mean, I have, I get upset when the obvious common sense cannot even be spoken. People will not listen. Mm -hmm. But I think the most fundamental change we need is a change in the way we produce food because that's, food is going to be very short. Well, that also that also relates to the to the inequality issue, and this is one of the things that became I became so conscious of in my work in international development. That you know we started out with people who were living off the land, but instead of helping them take greater control of their agriculture and be more productive in it in ways that are environmentally healthy we restructured in ways that turned over the control and ownership of that land to big corporations and all became all part of this process of concentrating wealth 
and giving control to the most wealthy people in the world of our access to the essentials of the means of living, starting with our food. It, it's, it's a very interesting, again, very simple situation. But, you know, we end up giving control of our actual means of living to people who control money. And then they say, you got to give us money if you want to eat or have access to water or a place to live or any of the essentials of basic living. And oh, by the way, we control the money. So you have to do what we ask you to do to get the money, which is to labor for them rather than to labor on the land, growing our own food and caring for the land in the way that maintains the systems of soil and water, et cetera, and so, so forth. So, you know, the details are so complex, but <laughs> the essentials are so simple and so obvious. You can't eat money, and there are no winners on a dead earth. And that sums it up. <laughs> it sums it up, David. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Rachel, are you there? Because uh, you just had a question or a comment. And Bonnie, there are questions in the chat that I'd like to Yes. There. I don't think Rachel is there. I think she's left. Okay, then Ron Hines, would you like to pose your question? Yeah, I'm uh, wrestling with a couple of questions, but a lot of it has to do with kind of grassroots people and right livelihood. And I'm wondering if the Pachamama Alliance, for instance, uh, the uh, Amazon uh, rainforest, provide some models for us and, and how um, people in many locales can be encouraged to, to live with the earth in the place where they are and be a part of a global community and yet still local communities that are life sustaining and with a sense of uh, right livelihood. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to answer that, and I'd like to tie it in with another question I see in the chat from Carrie, uh, and which Carrie Vasquez, uh, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. What state level approaches should we pursue in terms of US state level China relations? I think those two questions really come together uh, because um, the indigenous people, you know, I'm a co founder of the Pachamama Alliance. I, Ever since 1968, I've spent a lot of time in the Amazon and continue to do so. And I, while I don't want to glorify indigenous people, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to idealize them as person, as individuals, because I know there are crazy ones, there are violent ones, and there are also brilliant ones. They're people. <laughs> but what I do idealize is their belief in long term. So they, they have a very strong belief and recognizing that we all come from that belief system for most of the 250,000 years we've been humans on this planet, we've, we've, we've lived in life economies, we've lived in localized economies uh, that take responsibility and look to the long term. You don't do anything that's gonna be harmful to your children. That's been a basic human value for most of our history. It's only been within the last blink of the eye in history that's changed. And I think you know this, this issue of California is the fifth largest economy in the world. And how does it operate? And I think, Carrie, in answer to your question, um, one of the things is to really recognize what your impact, what California's impact is on the world. I am, I've, you know, I was at a co conference one time where someone stood up and talked with great pride about how there was no oil drilling off California's coast, except in some places that have been grandfathered around. Santa Barbara and other places, and they set it aside so you can't drill oil, which is nice, but instead the oil gets drilled in the Amazon and destroys the Amazon. So California exports its pollution. And to recognize that, I mean, it would be better to drill for oil off the coast of California where you've got pretty strong restrictions. When there was an oil spill of the in, of British uh, BP in, in the Gulf of Mexico, they've now spent over $40 billion to clean it up. At the same time, Texaco, Chevron now owns Texaco, uh, spills something like 50 times that amount in the Ecuadorian Amazon 
was fined 9.5 billion to clean it up and they haven't then they refused to do it so because it's in another country so to recognize that you know how do we how does california take care of its own energy problems H how do we take care of our food problems i had a discussion with the former president of whole foods one time and i asked him why california whole food stores were selling rice from indonesia when they could get rice in california and his answer was well environmentally it's much better to buy it in indonesia and like this really shocked me how can that be and he pointed out that in indonesia most of the rice is produced by irrigation that's gravity driven and in california it's pumped in from the colorado river and, and it uses huge amounts of energy just to get water and in Indonesia, it's transported from Indonesia to the United States in, in big ships in containers, which is pretty fuel efficient compared to the small trucks that transported around California. So he made the point that environmentally, <laughs> it was better to buy rice from California mm -hmm. than from a place 100 miles down the road, which, you know, I mean, that's sad. And, and so how does California address that? Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I can come up with an immediate answer, but I think you can, Carrie. <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, we've all got to go, that interests you. And, and every one of you out there, you follow your passion. You know, we've all got a role to play in this. What can you do? What can you do to make your local community more responsive and more responsible along these lines to convince Californians, listen, if we're going to use all this fossil fuels, we better start mining it on our own soil. And if we, we can protect our beaches better than we can protect the Amazon or the Saudi Arabian deserts. So let's take care of it locally. And let's, let's, let's figure out how we can develop irrigation systems and transportation systems so we can grow our own rice here mm -hmm. near our own homes. It, it's going to take us all to come together. And I think any, any of you who have a passion in this regard, go for it. Don't let anything stop you. You know, Carrie, get out there and, and make your state really responsible. I'm looking, you're down in that corner of my screen. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that's a great, great lesson here. And, and the indigenous people are very much that way. You know, in Ecuador, <clears throat> when they've been up against the oil companies, what we used to call tribes, they're now recognized as nations, the Achua, the Shua, the Kichua, the Warani, they were enemies. They fought each other. When I was a Peace Corps volunteer there in 1968 to 71, there were wars. Then they came together because they realized that the real enemy was not their neighbors, it was the oil companies. And then they formed greater federations and they realized that the real enemy wasn't even the oil companies. It was the people who dreamed of using oil. The dream, they were dream culture, so they talk in terms of the dream. It was a perception of the modern world of the need for oil. And that's when the Pachamama Alliance stepped in and, and decided that we were going to develop programs for changing the dream of the modern world, because ultimately the only way we're going to save the Amazon or the forest, magnificent forest where I live in the state of Washington, is by changing our perception of what it means to be successful human beings, mm -hmm. what it means to be successful. Thank you for that, John Perkins. Um, Ignacio has his hand up, and then Kevin Clark has a question also. Well, I, I just um, want to go back to something that John Perkins mentioned earlier about the, about the young people. And as I look at the photos here, <laughs> the youngest person I see is Carrie. Uh, maybe there may be somebody that uh, uh, doesn't have the, uh, their own picture up uh, is younger, but she appears to be the youngest. I think, I think we are a, an old folks movement. And I think that we really need to get together with the young people. And I want to, um, John Cobb and I, several years ago, just before the pandemic, uh, we went to a meeting of Sunrise Los Angeles and Sunrise Los Angeles um, is made of young people. The leadership is primarily women, first generation born in the United States. I find it's the most interesting and exciting movement that I have seen in a long time. And I have made a pledge to myself and I shared it with John that I, I'm going to be 
participating in as many meetings of, of, um, of um, Sunrise. And I encourage you to do the same thing in your own areas because that's where it's at. I mean, the, those, there's a lot of energy. They are the ones who gave Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and, and the uh, Senator of, of um, uh, Massachusetts, they are the ones who gave the uh, Green New Deal. They, they're the ones who really uh, started working on that and have given it to them. Uh, Jeff and I have talked about the Justice Democrats, and there's an, a little bit of a, of, of, of a uh, crossover there. But again, friends, it's nice to see you all over here, but um, we need to get out there and get with the young people and, and, and see, what, see, see if they can energize us more. I mean, uh, and, and bring them into this and to, uh, one at a time, two at a time. But if we do not go to them, they're not gonna come to us. Second thing is, is a question for all of you, but primarily to, uh, to uh, uh, John Perkins and Dave Corton and uh, Ron Phipps, people that know more about China. I've been listening to several lectures on YouTube by um, John Mearsheimer, you know, the, the, the man from the University of uh, Chicago, uh, who is, um, I, I personally like him very much. I like his analysis of what's happening in, in the Ukraine. It's not what you read in the, in the New York Times, it's completely the opposite. It places the blame right where it should be in the United States for what's happening right now in Ukraine. But I'm wondering about his perception of China. He thinks, he's saying China is on the rise, but it's still a long ways from really challenging the United States. And he doesn't believe that China, that China will dare to go into Taiwan because at this time in history, they would be completely, I mean, there, there are no winners in a, in a major thing like that, but still uh, he feels that, that China's calculations are such that they are not going to dare challenge the United States for at least another 15 to 20 years. I wonder if you folks agree with that. John Perkins, do you want to take that? Or John Cobb? Well, I'll start by saying I, 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 I think China has already challenged us big time. And China uh, it has taken over Africa's resources pretty much, and most of many of Latin America's. And now China's going through some very difficult times. I think she has made some big mistakes in the last couple of years, and uh, the Ukraine war has put China in a very, very difficult position. Uh, you know, it agrees with Russia in terms, and it has for a long time in terms of we, the United States no longer should be controlling the world, but. A lot of other countries agree with that too. A lot of you know smaller countries. So um, China's you know China sided with the Russia on that, and Russia Putin is a is, is a disruptor. That's his that's that's the only role he can really play these days. Is is a disruptor. He has a small economy. It's smaller than three of the states in the United States: California, Texas. It's, it's smaller than them. About the same as New York. Uh, but he's got nuclear weapons and China now is caught in this very, very difficult position of which of what to do about that war. But it's also been making mistakes along the line. It's been imposing its will on countries, even though it says it wouldn't. And it has been looking at building military bases. It's been building up its military. So uh, it's the, you know, the we don't know. There's no crystal ball as to where this is going to go. But I do believe it's it's safe to say that that China right now has totally outmaneuvered us during the past ten years, and its economy, by most measures, is still smaller than ours. As I said, it's about seventeen percent of the global GDP, whereas ours is about twenty five percent. But it's by other measures, it's just as big by by PP measurements, uh, parity measurements. So it's it's there. <laughs> it's not a question of will China become a world power. It is a world power. And my hope is that the, these two countries, the United States and China, will, will recognize that as two, the, two, the two world powers and the two of the world's greatest polluters, they must come together to stop climate change. I mean, we can continue to compete on many other levels, but let's come together on that one to begin with and then see what happens out of that. 
It's amazing, you know, I mean, when you think of how much we hated Germany when I was born, the year I was born, we were at war with Germany and uh, Japan. And, you know, now they're both allies of ours. And so, you know, the, the world has a way of adjusting to crises if we allow it to and if we, we have to push it to. But we can't be blindsided by biases. And unfortunately, today in the United States, I think there's way too many biases and there's a bigotry against against China and against the way China is approaching the world. And I suspect the same is true in China about the United States. So the, the real question is, how do we move beyond that into a new perception that we have to come together? We must partner in this one issue, if nothing else. May I just quickly re respond to John? I think Mearsheimer would say to you, you're correct in saying that economically, China is moving up, but they are not in any position to really challenge the United States militarily, and that it would hurt them economically should they challenge the United States militarily. And in the, um, I, I just, um, just before we got together, I read an article in which he is interviewed about the Solomon Islands. And he said, you know, don't, don't, don't go there. That is not as important as some of the other things that are happening where the Chinese are involved in other places. But at this time, he says, the, yes, the, the path, uh, I can see him saying that, you know, he, he's been, I've been watching a lot of Australian um, uh, conversations between Mia Scheimer and some of the some of the people in Australia, because Australia is a, is a country that squeezed on that. And he says, sooner or later, history is gonna force you to choose between siding with us or siding with the United, or with China. And he says, you, you know, it's a tragedy. I mean, and I, he uses that, he uses that, but he says, it's a tragedy that is not an immediate uh, thing for us. It's gonna be, he, he actually said, most of you are gonna be dead anyway. <laughs> by the time that happens, because China is still lagging behind the United States in terms of military power. Good. Thank you, Ignacio. And I think we have only uh, time for one more comment. Kevin Clark has, has been waiting quite a while to- Kevin, would you like to make a comment? Yes. Oh, well, I, <laughs> I don't really have a comment. My question was for John Perkins. Um, and um, it, in the description that you set up between the Washington Consensus and the Belt and Road Initiative, um, both of those economic systems are extractive of, econ of what we call resources, natural supplies, and then trading them and so forth. And neither one of those systems is promoting of the second thing you talked about, the kind of localization that we really need to defend our place. And, and promote, uh, you know, localization sufficiency, and so I don't understand the the two thriving, uh, conflicting systems between the United States and China. They both lead to the same kind of extractive trading uh, system that's destructive to Mother Earth. So, uh, what other kinds of uh, life economics? You called it life economics. What kind of system? Uh, can, uh, can we, we turn, turn to, to to promote life economics? Well, yeah, Kevin, I know we're very short on time. Uh, I would just say that I would totally agree with you that I don't mean to imply that the new Silk Road is the answer. It's, it's the same strategy. And what I was saying is that it's a brilliant perception that, they, that they've created. It's a brilliant selling tool. It's a marketing tool. And it's brilliant for that, I think. It's, it's more than a marketing tool. It's a reality, too. It, it happens. But... But it, it, it's been a, you know, I, 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 I first was teaching in, in China at an MBA program back in 2009, and, and I first started hearing about this idea, and I thought, why didn't we think of that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, as a tool of empire, as a tool yeah. of empire. But it's still uh, extractive, you know, we're yeah, still... It's still extractive, it's still, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's still, it's still using the same uh, economic hitman strategy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Thank you, John Cobb and John Perkins and everyone. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking of my father. He used to say, as a psychologist, 95%, if not more, of every problem is uh, knowing you have a problem and naming it. And I want to say, John Cobb and John Perkins, you have done that extremely well. And um, I look forward to working with everyone here as we find solutions to the problems that we are all very well aware of. And we um, uh, have a, a few announcements. And uh, please join us every fourth Thursday for a monthly meeting like this. Please come to our support group every week for Earthful Faith at three o'clock on, um, on Zoom Pacific Standard Time. And we have other programs, so check the website. And please call me anytime. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to talk with you. And we look forward um, to lots of uh, more community building together. And uh, Jeff, tell us more about your program uh, next month. And then the Institute for the Postmodern Development of China has a yearly forum. And they are going to be, uh, Dr. Zaha Wang will be coming to our next week meeting. And then they will be having a, a yearly forum that's advertised on our website that will begin the night after uh, we have our next program together. So tell us more about next month, Jeff. OK, so this is an easy one. Next month on May 26th, at this same time on a Thursday, we are, uh, we are having David Corton give a presentation about ecological civilization. So I don't really have to say much more because David Corton has already been himself the best publicity for, for that event uh, because he is so eloquent on speaking about uh, ecological civilization, all aspects of it. And so I, I encourage you to come and invite others to come. It's going to be a really powerful uh, presentation and, and conversation. Um, I also just want to add that I put my phone number in the chat as well. And if you have not yet found a way to, to get involved with the Living Earth Movement, please feel free to contact me or Bonnie. Our email addresses are also on the website. We have six different working groups that, that, are, uh, that are active or, or that we want to be active. And we hope that you'll find a way to plug in and and uh, do something that gives you life, as well as helping to give the earth life. Thank you, Jeff. And John Cobb, we want to give you the last word, and you have less than a minute. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks for John to share his wisdom. And I appreciate also the, the fact that we do have a little different perspective, but one that is extremely profound coming up at David Corton next week. So join us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Call me, call Jeff. Don't be a stranger. Adios.